I'll be continuing in my message by my spirit. Today is the 22nd installment. The title of today's message is going to be The Common Features of Heavenly Men. The Common Features what? Of Heavenly Men. The Common Features of Heavenly Men. I want us to declare this before I start. Let's declare. One, two, three, go. In Christ, I have eyes that see and ears that hear. In Christ, the veil has been removed from my heart. In Christ, I have the mind of Christ. Therefore, as the word of God is preached today, and by the help of the Holy Spirit, I understand what is being taught. Amen. So let's quickly open our Bibles to the book of Zechariah, chapter 4, verse 6 to 7. That's been the theme of this year. Zechariah chapter 4 from verse 6 to 7. Let's read together. He says, So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain. And he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. So I want us to read it a second time, this time around, putting your name, okay, in it. Let's go, one, two, three, go. So he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Gabriel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Gabriel, you shall become a plain, and Gabriel shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to you. I don't know the kind of mountain, great mountain that is before you today. Some people are facing different mountains before them today. But I want you to see that the way you will surmount that mountain is not going to be through your connections. It's not going to be through the people that you know. It's not going to be through your natural resources, but God is saying that the way this mountain will be surmounted will be what? By his spirit. By his spirit. So that's why the theme of this year have been by my spirit, by my spirit, by my spirit. You know, a lot of times before people can actually decide to trust in something, it is very difficult to get somebody who is very wealthy, somebody who is a billionaire, to trust in God as his source, right? Because naturally speaking, he has the billions and he has no need of God, I mean, to trust God as his source, okay? And that's why God kept telling Zerubbabel, it is not by might, it is not by power. So Zerubbabel, you may have very large human resources, you may have very large resources, but Zerubbabel, listen to this, Zerubbabel. If you are going to accomplish my work, you have to take your trust off what you have naturally to trust something that I have. You cannot trust the two at the same time. No, you have to trust one and you have to trust God. And that's why he says, not by might, nor by power, but by my what? Spirit. The Bible says in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he puts it this way cleanly. He says, let him that thinks he's wise in this world become a fool that he may become wise. That sounds, I mean, a bit confusing. He says, let him that is wise in this age. He said, become a fool that he may become wise. Does that sound um, funny? He says, let him that is wise in this age he says, become a fool that he may become wise. You see these two dimensions. He says, not by your natural wisdom. If you want the wisdom of the spirit, then you have to lose your trust in the wisdom of the natural to trust the wisdom of the spirit. That's why he says, let him that is wise, I can put it this way, let him that is rich in this age become poor, not naturally. He's talking about your trust in that, that he may become truly wealthy. Okay, so let's really look at the, I mean, the other scripture, Romans chapter 1, verse 3 to 4. Romans chapter 1, verse 3 to 4. Let's read together. Paul, a born servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the holy scriptures 
concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the son of God with power, what? According to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. And so we've been going through this over and over and over again, that Jesus, when Jesus lived on earth, that Jesus had two identities. He lived with one identity, but he had two identities. With one identity, he was proclaimed the son of David. You and I know that each of us, we come from somewhere, right? So naturally speaking, we come from somewhere. So Jesus, as a man, came from somewhere. He came from a father and a mother. His father was Joseph, and his father came from the lineage of David. And so the Bible says that concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, but you need to qualify that. It is what? According to the flesh. So it's from a natural standpoint. However, that was not all Jesus was. The Bible says that in the spirit, Jesus was actually the son of God. So in the spirit, he was the son of God. But when you looked at his body, his body, when you looked at him from a natural standpoint, he was like every other human being, the son of Joseph or the son of David. Am I making sense here? And so, however, we notice that Jesus lived on earth like no other man ever lived. In fact, in one occasion, the Bible says that after he had spoken to the wind and the storm, his disciples said, what manner of man is this? So in other words, he lived a different kind of life from other human beings. Am I making sense? But we are researching to see that the reason why he lived differently from every other human being, even though he had the same body, was that there was somebody else living inside him. And that person was the son of God in his spirit, according to the spirit. Because if you understand how Jesus lived, then you too will understand how you will live to display the same attributes and qualities that Jesus displayed. Scripture, Romans chapter 7. Let's read together. Not until halfway through the festival did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews there were what? Amazed. And asked, how did this man get such learning without, without having been taught? Verse 16, Jesus gave them the answer. Let's read together. Jesus answered, my teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. So Jesus was invariably telling them that I know that if you evaluate me from the person I am according to the flesh, I didn't go to school. I joined my father's business as a, as a carpenter very early in my life, right? So this kind of wisdom that you are hearing, in fact, the fact that I can stand up to begin to teach the professors of the law, people who, who have been to school many years, means that there must be something that I'm, I have confidence in separate from myself according to the flesh. So Jesus inside was connected with the father. He was the son of God according to the spirit. So when he spoke, he didn't speak from natural wisdom here. He spoke from his connection with the Father on the inside as the Son of God. So when the wisdom came out, they saw that the wisdom far exceeded the kind of wisdom they displayed. And that's why the Bible said they opened their mouth. Actually, I'm the one saying it. The Bible said they were amazed. They were wowed. Am I making sense? Now, but over the weeks, the last two weeks, we've been talking about a message called the heavenly men. And the reason why we've been talking about a message called the heavenly men is because we are beginning to realize that Jesus did not live like an earthly man. He lived as the heavenly man. He was the heavenly man on earth. He was the only heavenly man on earth when he was living on earth. But that was not the end of God's purpose. Jesus being on earth was not the end of God's purpose. God did not want to have one heavenly man on earth. God wanted to have heavenly men on it. And so let's quickly look at God's eternal purpose in Genesis chapter 1 from verse 26 to 27. Let's read it again. He said, then God said, let us make man what? In our image, according to our likeness. Uh -huh. Let them have, let them have what? Let them have what? That means this image Dominion is linked with this image. He says, let us make man in our what? 
image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over what the fish of the sea over the beds of the air and over the cattle over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth verse 27 so god did what created man in his own image in the image of god he created him male and female he created them so in the mind of god when god created man do you know what he did he took man out of himself god took man out of himself man was a replica of god the bible says that he made man to be in his image in his likeness god wanted men on earth to be like god on the earth because he made them out of himself Bible says that he created them in his own image, in his own likeness, in our own image and according to our own likeness. And so when God created Adam, Adam was supposed to keep having children, reproducing according to his kind, right? So that the whole earth would be filled with men who were made what? According to his image and according to his likeness. But the Bible says that before Adam and Eve gave birth to one child, what happened to them? They sinned. Did you hear that? They sinned. That means the image of God in them got corrupted. And so let's see what happened in Genesis 5.3. Quickly, let's look at what happened in Genesis 5.3. Let's see together. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son. What? Was this before he sinned or after he sinned? So what would have happened if Adam had not sinned and given birth to this boy? So it would have been in the image and likeness of Adam, who is still in the image and likeness of God. Does that make sense? But you see here, the Bible says that Adam lived 130 years and begot a son. And the son, as God has decreed, was what? In his own likeness and after his image. Unfortunately, this image and likeness of Adam was no longer in the image and likeness of God. Am I making sense? Good. But God had not finished. His intent still to multiply and proliferate his image on earth had not left him. And so guess what he did? He decided to bring one person again. Who was in his own likeness and image? Who was that? Let's look at scripture. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15. What does he say? He is. Who is he there? Jesus. He says he is the image of what? The invisible God. The firstborn over all creation. So when Jesus was walking on the earth, Adam had given birth to a lot of children who were in his own image that was not in the image of God. So Jesus was the only one carrying the image of God on the inside of him. For the Bible says he is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn, what? NLT version says Christ is the what? The visible image of the invisible God. So when Jesus was walking on earth, everything you saw Jesus doing was a replica of what God would have done if God was there on earth. He was the exact representation of the invisible God on the earth. The only reason why God brought Jesus on earth was not so that Jesus would be the only image of God on the earth. God's intent was still to proliferate, was still to reproduce his image in the lives of men. Is that not true? Next, next slide, don't worry, it's wrong scripture. John chapter 1 verse 14. Let's look at what the Bible calls Jesus. It says, this was Jesus. It says, and the word became what? Flesh. And did what? Dwelt among us. And what? And we beheld his glory. Yes. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So Jesus was the only begotten of the Father when he was on earth. Only son. Only one carrying the image of God, right? But what happened when he died, when he was buried, when he rose up? Jesus is no longer the only begotten son of God. Who is he? Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. I'm giving you a background. 
Revelations 1 5. Let's read together. And from Jesus Christ, uh huh, who is the faithful witness, and what? He moved from being the only begotten to become what? The first begotten. Because you and I are now begotten children of God. So he no longer is the only begotten. He's no longer the only one carrying the image and likeness of God. Everyone who is a Christian is now a begotten, a begotten of the Father, right? Therefore, Jesus lost that status. He's no longer the only begotten. He's now the what? The first begotten. Let's look at John 20, 17 and look at when Jesus rose from the dead. I want you to see what he told um, Mary Magdalene. Let's read together. Jesus said to her, uh-huh, do not cling to me, uh-huh, for I have not yet ascended what? To my father. But go to, go to, what does that mean? It means you and I. Do you think you were just saying, brother, you know, in my country, I mean, particularly among certain tribes in my, in my country, right? Some people look at their aunt, some aunties that they have a point. When they relate to them, they say, that's my sister. Do you understand? But that's not the case here. <laughs> when Jesus is saying that my brethren, he's actually saying my brethren in the real sense of it. Because we have become brothers because we came from one father. That's how you actually become brothers in real life. Is that not true? Not because you have a cousin, you have an auntie here. That's my sister. That's, that's not how it works. Your brother is somebody who has come from the same father. So a mother. So he says, my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, let's be together. Before, when Jesus was talking, he would say, my father said this, my father said this, my father said it. But when he rose from the dead, he added, and your father. Meaning that now, after you become born again, he's now, we have one father. You, inside you, you have now been reproduced. You have now, you now have the image of the father that was my father, or that is my father. Am I making sense here? And so over the weeks, do you know what we've been trying to establish? I've been using different scriptures to show you that we are the exact replica of Christ. So today I have told you, for example, that God had an image in mind and he wanted man to become in his image. But man's, his image was corrupted. But when Jesus rose from the dead, now we Christians are the exact replica of Christ on the earth. Inside us, we have the image of God on the inside of us. And so let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45 to 49. Let's read together. The first man was of the earth. We just read that when Adam gave birth to his son, he gave birth to his son like himself. So he says the first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man, what? Is the Lord from heaven. That's Christ. Verse 48. And as was the man of dust, uh-huh, so also are those who are made of dust. Uh -huh. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are... Are there any heavenly men here? Are you sure? If you're an earthly man, get up. If you're an earthly man, get up. Okay, no earthly man came today. So also are those who are what? Heavenly or heavenly men. So, and as we have borne the image of the man of dust. Adam gave birth to somebody in his own image. We too were of the image of that first Adam. Flu season comes. Some of us get sick. That's the image of the man of dust. They said, businesses will start businesses, they fail. That's the image of the man of the dust. We notice that it's as if we are susceptible to anything that happens on earth. Famine affects us. Recession affects us. That's the image of the man of dust. But there is another image, the image of Christ. When he was on earth, we didn't hear that he was sick. In fact, you know, and we were going to come there, he would touch people who were leprous. Normally, instead of the sickness coming to him, rather, the sickness goes away. <laughs> but in the Old Testament, when you touch somebody who is leprous, you are declared unclean. It's contagious. But when Jesus came, there was a leper, a, a leper that came to him and said, Master, if you are willing, you can make me clean. What did he say? He said, I am willing, be thou clean. And he touched him. He touched him. He touched him. 
It should, it should be contagious. No, no. The image of the man of dust is that that sickness comes on him. But the image of the heavenly man is different. Rather than the sickness coming on him, rather the sickness goes. Am I making sense? That means that when we come into a room of sick people, their sickness does not come on us. Our life goes to them. Again, I'm trying to renew your mind to the image of the heavenly man. Because you are all heavenly men. But we're going there. We're going to understand why is it that we come to a room rather than the sickness coming on us, our life goes to them. What component, what substance do we have in us that causes that to happen? We're going to go through that as the days come. Today, I have titled this message. If you notice what I have titled this message, what have I titled this message? The common features of the heavenly man. It is deliberate. I would have called it the features of the heavenly man, and I would still have been correct. But the word common is deliberately, has been deliberately added. Why did I deliberately add the word common? What does the word common mean? The dictionary meaning of the word common simply means belonging equally to. Did you hear that? Belonging what? Equally to, uh-huh. Shared alike by. What did I say? Shared alike by. Then another, I mean, meaning says pertaining or belonging equally to an entire community. Pertaining or belonging equally to a what? An ent Do you know why it's important I say this? I use the word common. Because over the years of being a Christian, I have seen an anomaly in the body of Christ. And that anomaly is that People ascribe certain features to men of God. Or they ascribe certain features as though they are exclusive to a man of God. Or as though certain, some of these features that are supposed to be common among Christians are exclusive to bishops, or exclusive to geos, or exclusive to who else? To 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 overseers, no, or apostles, or no, what we are talking about today are common features of the heavenly men, not common features of pastors, not common features of people in fivefold ministry of evangelists. No, no, these are common features of every Christian. I was growing up in science, we we're told that human beings have certain characteristics, right? They use a mnemonic called Mr. Niger D. M for movement, R for respiration, N for nutrition, I for irritability, G for growth, E for excretion, R for reproduction, D for death. And they studied the human race and they thought that every human being, right, has these characteristics with the exception of none. That is what we call common, features that are common. You cannot say, for example, that when I get a Samsung phone and I get an Apple phone, although they have some features that may be common, not all features are common. Because not all features are shared alike by an Apple phone and a Samsung phone. Even among Samsung phones, if it's a Samsung phone S10, and a Samsung phone S23, although they are from the same manufacturer, they, although they share certain common characteristics, not all features are shared by these two phone, types of phones. Am I correct? But when we are talking about the heavenly men, the features of the heavenly men are common across board. They are shared alike. It's very important. Let's quickly look at an example in Esther chapter 6 and verse 13. Esther chapter 6, verse 13. Let's read together. I want us to read something. I want to show you something. Let's read together. When Haman uh -huh, told his wife, Zeresh, and all his friends, everything that had happened to him, his wise men and his wife, Zeresh, said to him, if Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him but will surely fall before him. I want you to notice what happened. A wicked man called Haman planned the death, plotted the death of this man called Mordecai. 
but somehow God turned it around, right? And Haman noticed that he had the disfavor of the king. Is that not true? And then the wife Zeresh said to her husband, if Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish descent. What is this statement telling you? It's telling you that this feature is not exclusive to Mordecai. It is common among people of Jewish descent. Which means I could easily have removed Mordecai's name and put in another, Jew, a, another Jewish man's name. Is that not true? It is not because they fasted. It is not because they prayed. No, it says anybody of Jewish descent. It didn't say anybody of Jewish descent that fast. It didn't say anybody of Jewish descent that reads the Bible. It didn't say that. We need to understand. I keep saying this over and over again. We need to understand what the word of God does, what the Holy Spirit does, and what Christ has already done. Because very soon you notice that I do not read my Bible to become holy. I don't. I do not read my Bible to become righteous. I don't. Because the Bible is not what made me righteous. The Bible is not what made me holy. It is what Christ did. It is an accomplished fact. But somebody saying, hey, but we have to read the Bible. Yes. We have to read the Bible, but it has a different purpose. Prayer is not what makes me holy. Fasting is not what made me holy. The person that made me holy is Christ. His walk on the cross, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, his sitting, made me who I am in the spirit. It's very important because if you don't know this, You'll be reading the Bible, you'll be praying, thinking it will make you all these things, then you have fallen from grace. So very important. Let's look at one feature of the heavenly man. Give me Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24. This is the foundation. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24. And put on, uh-huh, uh-huh, the regenerate self, Created in uh -huh, God-like, in true righteousness and holiness. Let's look at NKJV version. What does it say? And that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness. Notice, I want you to be careful about tenses when you read the Bible. What tense is here? What does it say? Which was created. So it is not something that God is about to create. When you got born again, when was it created? When you got born again. It was created in you. But what was created in you? He said, that thing that was created in you is truly righteous and holy. It's truly what? Righteous and holy. So one of the features, common features of the heavenly men is righteousness and holiness. Foundation. This is where every Christian must operate. Is what? Righteousness and what? Holiness. Pastor D, please come. If you look at Pastor D, I want us to look at Pastor D, and Pastor D will reflect what we talked about Jesus. That Jesus is the son of what? Joseph. So this is Pastor D's physical body. This is Pastor D's physical self. When Pastor D got born again, imagine I am Christ. Can you see me? Imagine I am Christ. When Pastor D got born again, right? Before he got born again, God came to me and replicated me and put me inside him. So Pastor D's spirit is here. This is me. So now when Pastor D got born again, he is Jesus according to the flesh. He is the son of Joseph according to the flesh. But that is not all Pastor D is. This is me. This is called the new man. This is me. This is Pastor D in the spirit. Pastor D is Jesus Christ, the son of God. But this guy was born naturally holy. This guy 
was born naturally righteous. Did you get that? Now, Pastor Dick can look at himself. He noticed that he's flawed, that he doesn't have all his acts right. Does that mean he's not holy? Does that mean he's not righteous? He has not put on his righteousness. Am I making sense? However, in the spirit, he is righteous. He is righteous. Am I making sense? And I want you to understand that this person that Pastor D now is in the spirit, the righteousness he possesses in the spirit does not develop. Say that again. The righteousness and holiness, he does not grow in it. He does not grow in it. Somebody say, hey, hey, hey. you mean he doesn't? Ah, how will you grow in holiness? Yes, in the outworking of holiness, he may grow. But the person here does not grow. He's now as righteous as he will be until Jesus comes, even in eternity. He's as righteous as that. Did you get that? This guy on the inside, the spirit, does not grow. The outworking and the knowledge of this man grows, but the guy here in the spirit does not grow. That's number one, you must know. Number two, listen very carefully. Number two, the righteousness and holiness of this guy does not fluctuate. Say that again. Does not what? Fluctuate. That means even when Pastor D feels otherwise, this guy on the inside is still straight. He does not fluctuate. He still wants the will of God. He wants to do the will of God. He loves God. He's full of love. He's full of peace. He's full of joy. He does not... Look, this thing I'm telling you is very important. If you don't understand, you cannot live consistently a holy life. It's impossible. This guy on the inside does not fluctuate. <laughs> If you're wondering why is Pastor Gabriel saying this, very important. This guy on the inside, he's not affected by what happens on the outside. Am I making sense? Teju, please come. Teju is a, 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 a lady, isn't he? Pastor D's wife. Now, she's not. I'm just using that, that as an example. Teju is a lady. The Bible says something. It says something about a, a man's conduct towards a woman. Is that not true? And what's the conduct of a man towards a woman? It should be pure and holy. Is that not true? And um, it shouldn't be unclean. But you and I know that the status of people in the world today, ladies in the world, you see all sorts, today they wear different kind of clothes. Right? Is that not true? Sometimes can be revealing, sometimes even more revealing, sometimes. But now, the man here may be tempted. The man here may be tempted, may be feeling, oh no. But this guy here never is dead to what happens on the outside. He's aligned to God. Whatever God wants, what he wants. He's aligned. It's very important you know this. Because while you are feeling what you are feeling on the outside here, you must be conscious that there's a permanent guy on the inside that feels otherwise. Oh my God. You don't understand. <laughs> if you understand this, it will set you free. So while this one is doing all the gimmicks, getting worse and worse and worse in uncleanness, the man on this guy may be affected, but the man here, oh my God, is loving God more, fears God, loves God. And who is this man? He's Pastor D in the spirit. Does that make sense? So every command that God wants you to do, this man already is. Always like that. In the will of God. Does not want to do anything outside God's will. Where there is a problem is this guy here. So we have to teach Pastor D how to live from this guy here in the face of temptation. Because if he can learn how to how to, how to live by this guy here? What will happen to his conduct? His conduct will be increasing in holiness. What do I say about the righteousness of this guy? He does not, he does not grow, he does not develop. Is that not true? And it does not fluctuate. 
Okay, good. Give me the next scripture. Next scripture, Hebrews 4, 16. I want to bring out something. Let's read together. Let us, therefore, come to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. Is God a holy God? And those who approach him must be holy. But how many of us are in conduct holy? How many of us in conduct are holy? Nobody is raising on their hand. In conduct. In conduct, everybody moving towards holiness, but we are not as holy as God in conduct yet. Because anything that is done outside of faith is sin. Anybody that knows to do good and do it not to him is sin. I'm not talking of all the nonsense things. I'm talking of the immediate grit. You see that we are not yet there. Now, if we are not yet there, how then do you approach a holy God? Because it says, let us therefore come. Let us therefore come. Does it mean we cannot approach God? Since he's a holy God and we have not yet perfected our acts. 